Greetings and welcome to a new season of Arevna Den. This topic series is called Dark Thoughts, and it's going to be shorter than the first season. It's not going to be like 20 episodes, probably only be a three, maybe even four part episode, uh, delving into the thoughts that we're having in this day and age relating to the prophetic words and the fulfillment of those promises which were given by God and the prophets speaking into the turning of the tables and the flipping of everything that is supposed to be coming and seeing a restoration, seeing new things being brought out into the world, seeing a recompense, seeing provision given to us. And the whole purpose of season one was to sort of delve into that and give you guys a little bit of uh, outlook as to where the prophets were coming from and what they were speaking into and biblically how it ties in to everything that is going down today. Um, and my own thoughts on scripture and uh, certain passages and what they actually may be interpreted to be. Uh, and where we were going with that as to now, which is where some of us, uh, as far as I have been seeing online, especially with certain clips and uh, lectures, <clears throat> is our trust issues that we're having with the prophets right now and the waiting for the fulfillment to actually kick in the high gear. It seems that ever since the end of 2023, probably around the time of Yom Kippur, um, we've, we've seen sort of this twisting begin to happen where not just externally, but I think for a lot of us internally, there's been some changes going on. We've we've felt like there's something there. There's something bubbling around inside of us. And I know that I'm not the only one. Um, as I've seen other people speak online mentioning this, like there's there's a there's a change in the atmosphere, you know, but there's also a change in here too, like like something's something's brewing with inside where we're starting to feel something coming alive. And then of course uh, after 2023 and 2024 hit this new year, it's almost like there's just been this pop of explosions and exposures and revealings and people just almost flipping the script per se on how they've been feeling while others at the same time have been turning for the worst and the stuff that they believed in are starting to become a little more spiteful and angry at the things that they have not seen fulfilled and I think this is a route that I'm going to be taking with these episodes as to why are we having these dark thoughts why are we pushing these things forward instead of manifesting and speaking into what God is calling us to do at this time which there has been many 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 prophecies on that and, and I don't even want to say prophecies but just words speaking into it hey God has ushered us into this time he wants us to be in alignment with what he's doing he wants us to speak to proclaim to be in agreement with this change that he is bringing forth and I think a lot of people myself included though I think I'm starting to get more on the lighter side and I'll explain why later either in this video or in the coming videos um how that change happened um I, I think the uh, agitation and anxiety within the weight that we're having uh, is we need to question why we're having this. And um, I, I think it's I think we're reaching a pivotal moment to where the floodgates are going to burst open at this time. We're going to actually start seeing these exposures, seeing these reveals. And I think the enemy is fighting and pushing back and stomping as hard as he can to make sure we are not in agreement with it. He wants to wear us out. He wants to have us so beaten down and so just pummeled into the dirt that we throw in the towel. We give up. We give in. We, we just were like, I'm out. I'm, I'm not doing this anymore. I have no interest in it. You know, I'm backing away. <clears throat> Everything that I was speaking into during the first season or trying to wake people up to, it's uh, I see a lot of people that they're just like, you know what? I just, you know. I'm, I'm done. Um, they're tired. They're sick of the waiting. And I think that's a sign. I think that's probably a good indication that we're right on the eve of a breakthrough because the enemy is trying so hard to make sure that we are just absolutely, we just, <laughs> you, you know what, uh, in this series, forgive me for some of you who are Christians and listening to this and wanting to get into the word, but I think part of me wants to get a little bit more emboldened and I know that swearing is supposed to be just forbidden and taken into context only in the rarities 
like Brad Stein said, you slam your hand in the car door, something's coming out of your mouth, you know. Save it for those incidences where you don't want to forcefully push it out yourself. But I think we need to be a little bit more emboldened um, in, in our walk and get straight to the point and start speaking in a manner that doesn't really want to profane God in any sort of way, shape, or form, but get to the point and become en enriched and have a little bit more flavor in what we are speaking. Because I think we've been lulled to sleep by the enemy and we, we we can't we can't be this tough christian warrior spiritual generation that is coming forth right now in, in this new age that is being birthed we we just need to we need to pussyfoot around everything and we need to be lighthearted and we you know we, we can't we can't uh take anything too seriously we need to be tolerant of everything we can't offend anyone and we just we need to tiptoe everywhere and it's just like you, you know what I think that's part of our problem is that we've as Christians have become a doormat and we've just allowed these things to happen. Uh, we gave the enemy an inch and he took 50,000 miles. You know, it's just like we've just laid down our arms. We've just like, well, if we just, you know, let them do this, maybe they'll leave us alone. There is no end to evil. There's no, there's no evil does not stop itself. Okay, you have to stop the evil. You have to become emboldened and you have to stand up and you have to pull up your, you know, gird up your loins and just be a man about it or be a woman about it for those of you who are watching. I'm just, you understand what I'm saying. You have to be emboldened to take these actions and sometimes you have to say the harsh things. And lately, pardon my French, but we have been getting our ass kicked a lot and we have been beaten down into the ground. We have been pushed down to the ground. We are supposed to be kings and priests of the new heaven we're supposed to be warriors and ambassadors of heaven we are supposed to be the bride of christ and we are just laying down as a doormat for the enemy and we have to stop this needs to stop now we have to stand up we have to fight back we have to say you're not coming one inch further we're not going to lay down for you anymore we're not going to have you stampede over us we're not going to do it in the light of tolerance because we have a fear of being called intolerant or racist or homophobic or z zealot or you know a conspiracy theorist or a fanatic and it's it's getting just absolutely positively insane that their words which are completely irrelevant now they hold no water there's there's no use for them in any way shape or form under the sun and yet we still take offense to it oh i don't, I don't want to offend anyone you know what offend someone offend somebody Start getting offensive. Start taking the offense. Start doing that. Start waking up. Start becoming emboldened. This is getting ridiculous. This is absolutely, positively, unabashedly ridiculous. We need to start standing up for our Lord and Savior and start standing as soldiers and as warriors, as part of his team, declaring and decreeing and intercessing and praying and being emboldened into what he is doing. Because we're just, we are just lulled to sleep by the enemy, or we are just stampeded over in a thousand front attack, and we're just allowing it to happen. It absolutely, positively needs to stop. You need to grow a pair of balls. I'm sorry, you need to do it. I'm sorry if this is sounding offensive. I'm going to start, if that if that's offends you, it's going to get worse. Brace yourselves, because we're going to go on a ride, okay? We are in the midst and at the forefront of a spiritual warfare. There's no more sitting on the fence. You can't sit on the fence. Maybe, oh, something gonna, maybe I'll just do it. I'll just wait for something to happen and maybe I'll join. It's kind of like that Dennis uh, Dennis Miller joke. That's what it was. You know, he's like, he was, I, I don't believe in Christianity. Once I see people start rising, I'll be like, okay, I, I get it. You know, and then he, no, no, that's not how it works. In the blinking of an eye, you go. You won't have time to be like, oh, okay, I get it. No, no, you won't have time to process it before you finally realize what has happened. You don't wait till the last minute. You jump on board right now and become part of the army before the last minute. You start taking action immediately. You start getting all your concept ideas, theologies, thoughts, everything together. You start contemplating and start thinking about what it is exactly that you're doing here. I'm speaking to the Christians too. Agnostics and atheists, you, you got a lot more things to work out. We're going to be going through this in the dark thoughts today. Why we're having these 
just bad thoughts, just not believing anything the Lord is saying. And from a Christian perspective, I'll be diving into this. I'll be speaking a lot about the processes of how C.S. Lewis himself did it. We'll be going through the tertium quid and the trilemma and uh, Pascal's wager, uh, reducto ad absurdum. We'll, we'll be talking about a lot of this and we'll be using these thoughts and these ideas this process to work out our own dark thoughts on why we're having such discouragement, such despair, such depression during this time when we should be giving glory and reverence and awe uh, to the Lord as well as speaking into what he's calling us to do as well and being joyous during this time, even in the pressing. And believe me, if there's anyone who needs to hear this message, it's me. <laughs> so because I am at the forefront of this. I am. I, I can't explain how many times I wanted to throw in the towel, call it quits, just say literally f this God. I'm I'm not doing it anymore. And there's been times, yeah, I've I've just boldly swore to him. And I think his love transcends the rage that we have. But at the same time, we need to maybe rein in it a little bit and start contemplating and start thinking exactly why we're having these thoughts, why we don't believe in the Lord, why. Um, this time we are in, this stretching time, this being away from the people we care about time, the cave dwelling season, the path setting season, the pioneering season, there's many things that God is calling us to do, but all of them have one thing in common. And that's the fact that the majority of us have been separated from something, from someone, from a lot of someones, from a lot of things. He's been honing in and focusing and calling us to find and return to our first love and lean into him more before we move forward into anything else that this world has to offer. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added unto you. Well, we've been just wanting the added unto us without seeking the kingdom of God, without looking to God first. And I think that's our first flaw. And I wouldn't really exactly call it a uh, a flaw so much as uh, incorrect thinking, a misunderstanding of how we're perceiving all of this. And this is why I'm going into the dark thoughts topics. This is why I'm starting this series to maybe give you some insight, to give you some thoughts to maybe pick at and ponder on and be like, you know what, maybe I was looking at this perspective wrong. Maybe I was understanding what you were trying to do wrongly or not coming into agreement with what it is that you're trying to do at this particular time because we live in a world of TikTok and everything needs to happen right now instantly give it to me now or I'm the hell out of here you know we need to maybe take a breath take a step back realize what God's doing in the long haul not just in our lives but for the entire world and realize that this is going to be a package deal and it's not circling and encompassing directly around us the minute that we understand that I think the better we can walk through this and what I mean by walk through it is that we're not finished yet. <laughs> so I think you're going to definitely need to listen to this series just to maybe, hopefully, possibly, Lord willing, help you in this to overcome these thoughts that you have or take a different route, a different perspective into why you're having this uh, because it's going to get darker. It's going to get more intense. There is going to be exposures. We're going to see it ramped up constantly but you need to understand is that the more exposures there are the more cracking open of the door the more revealing of the wizard behind the curtain to everything that is going down it's not going to be the less that the enemy is going to retaliate it's going to be the more they're going to retaliate the more exposures that are coming especially if things turn around in a way where uh trump becomes president or it turns out you know there's the exposures that show that he was right all along the people start understanding that he is the cyrus of this time he is the anointed one david's anointed one of this time if you don't believe what i have to say go back to season one because there's a lot that you missed i'm not going to recover it all here i'm going to just do bits and pieces and if you need to catch up go back and watch season one before you watch this um or you can watch this first, and if you don't believe me, then just watch this season, and then go back to season one and watch it, and there'll be a lot more explained into it. Um, if the exposure of Trump comes out before the enemy's final move, I'm pretty sure that's what's going to make them go absolutely insane. That they are just going to lose it. And the masks are going to be opt. 
there's nothing under the sun that they won't do to bring themselves back in the power. I think this is the one thing that a lot of us need to understand is that there's going to be a flipping of the tables, but what we have to understand is that they're not going to go down without a fight. And right now, they're freaking out. <clears throat> they're losing it. They understand that they're losing the narrative. Their People are not believing in their agenda. But the fight isn't over yet. It's still going. I mean, it's it's gonna it's gonna be ramped up, you know, to the nth degree. Especially the more exposures that come out, especially the more revealing, especially the more of the masses, the sleeping masses that are not woken up to any of this, including a lot of Christians who don't believe it. Once it starts kicking in the gear, it's it's hell on earth time. So be prepared for it because they will release something. They will do something. They will stop at nothing to get that power back. And it will not be us, but it will be the power of God that ultimately stops them. That pulls them into this trap to, to the point that the exposures happen so much. They take the bait of what they need to do to finally do their, their big push and wake up the masses to what they're doing. But also ultimately to get God to step in and stomp them out. Now it's going to be a partnership. God is going to act on this. There's angelic hosts all around, man. I don't know about you, but I can definitely sense them. It's almost to the point that, not technically, but it's almost to the point that I can, I can see them. Um, there's just spiritual warfare all over the place. And it'll be on the working of God in alignment with them, the spiritual hosts and the angelic hosts, as well as people down here, the intercessors, the prophets, the people speaking, declaring and decreeing, but also the people who are the white hats. You got the military, uh, all the generals that are in on this, the ones that are going to be starting up the military tribunals. And once this thing flips, they're going to be taking action on all of this. It's a giant movement that is happening. And I know it sounds ridiculous, but for those of you who have been paying attention and have been noticing certain things, certain signs, certain just little nuggets of information that have been giving out, either by President Trump, by military officials, by the prophets, by white hats, by um, anyone speaking into this more or less, you don't have to be a prophet, you can be a watchman on the wall. You, you, you see things, you see stuff coming out and you know that something's going to happen. Something is on the verge of happening. And we've been speaking that for years. And a lot of us have been getting agitated and really ticked off as to why it hasn't happened yet. And a lot of us want to throw on the towel. We're angered. We're depressed. We're in despair. We're discouraged. We're just depleted. We're worn out. We're just, we, we're just like, well, Lord, we, we can't take one more step. We're just so tired. We're so exhausted. We need to start speaking into it. Now, in my first season, that's where I was. I was just like, Lord, I just, I, I, I can't. I am quite literally, and I'm not joking, ready to put a gun in my mouth and pull the trigger. I am that worn out. I'm, that, I'm just that calling it quits. And if I didn't have this fear of thinking that suicide would have brought me to hell, I would have been dead years ago. Thankfully, by the grace of God, and me constantly praying into it and sometimes yelling and swearing at him he helped me through it and i'm starting to get a better perspective on this and starting to understand a few things which is why i want to speak into this with the dark thoughts for the troubles that some of you may still be having if you're in that dark spot in that dark thought that i was in a couple of years ago even up till last year really um and still haven't processed it out. You, you don't know how to how to figure it out in your head because maybe the church, maybe someone else who wanted to help you that was a Christian couldn't really explain it or define it themselves. I'm going to be going into that with the apologetics of C.S. Lewis and a few other people, and I hope that helped. So now that I've gone into that wild and crazy introduction, um, we will start it off. As I said, I might write some notes. As you can see, I didn't. Nope, because I'm just I'm just that asinine this is this is just an outline i'm just going through random topics hey let me just run it down and do some headliners and what to do but i didn't do the the actual you know subcategories within it i'm just like i'm just going to write some titles go through it and run it that way because again i feel that if the lord wants to speak i'm not going to write out an outline 
you know, and then have him interrupt me. I'm just going to have him interrupt me. And I'm just going to have him flow through me on the things that he wants to say if and whenever he wants to speak through me. Hopefully so. And hopefully I'm not going to go on a big tangent and not have anything that he wants to say to me or to you during this time. I'm still going to try and do it as I did in the original season. And I'm going to see what happens because I found out that that's that's shocking and awing to me as well, too. When I go back and listen to those and I'm like, man, this... Some of these words didn't come from me, man. It's like you could definitely tell that it was the Holy Spirit uh, speaking some of the things he wanted to come out. Not always, but there are some things in there that it just, I could just feel it. And I enjoy those and I enjoy it when he can actually uh, uh, speak through me when I am in agreement with him to allow him to, to use me as his vessel. Um, that's not... I'm not saying that in a prideful or boastful way. Um, it's just, I'm just glad that he can so I could get thoughts and helps out from him to you. And um, I guess, I guess that's it. Outline form, uh, just titles, no notes. I'm going to go through this again, <laughs> blindly, try and explain what I know and hopefully have the Holy Spirit speak through me probably hopefully more times than not in my own voice because there's a lot of muddled stuff within me that I push out as well too which may give it kind of a grainy hazy uh, outlook on everything once you filter the Holy Spirit through yourself and you put it out there's a uh, unless you're totally completely open to just letting the Holy Spirit ramble through you and not putting your own two cents in uh, if you, if you do that, it'll come out clean. But if you do put in your own two cents and you start filtering it through your own soul and your own body, there's, there's sometimes a lot of, there's a lot of graininess and a lot of muddled water that comes into it. And for those of you who listen to the prophets, I'm sure you've figured that out by now. Um, <clears throat> you, you just need to find the ones that you know will be the most helpful to you. But don't always throw out the prophetic words with the ones you don't agree with or the ones that do dis give you discouragement. Sometimes they're there for the Lord to help you process that out of your soul. You know, you're angry for what they're saying for a reason, and maybe the Lord is helping you to do that. But if all you're getting all the time from that person is just constant rage, constant worry, constant, just like, ah, oh, I just, I don't know if I can do this. This makes me want to kill myself again. You know, it's like, nope, you need to... You need to get away from that. You need to start listening to other prophets, which give you encouragement, which give you the word of the Lord that you could dive into, that you could eat the meat and be like, yes, this is what I need. This is what I, this is what I needed. And then go back to the ones that give you the discouragement. Listen to it again. Compare it to scripture. Cross-reference always with scripture. Take it to the Lord. Take it to the Holy Spirit. Ask him for discernment on that. Ask him to defrag what they were saying. And then compare it to also to what the prophets say. Is this in alignment with, with, with what they said? Well, yes, but this guy ticked me off. Well, why did he tick you off? Go back and defrag it. Work it out that way. And constantly go back to the ones that give you encouragement. That way you can build up better ideas, better calling, better understanding of what the Lord is trying to say from you from a, from a whole variety, a whole spectrum of different prophets and different ranges and different things. You can pick out the the meat um i'm sorry you can eat the meat and pick out the bones i guess is the best way to say it because there's again a lot of soul that gets pushed out into what the prophets are saying and they put in their own discernments and it's like well that we're you know i understand what you're saying but i don't agree with you with what your soul has tied into it maybe because of your own past experiences or your own uh workings with the lord that aren't in agreement with what he's calling me into so Always take that to heart too. Don't just listen to the prophets and be constantly in pissed off mode or listen to what they're saying and not understand that certain words like now and soon and about to and this hour uh, don't exactly mean that now and soon and about to and this hour. We're going to dive into that a little more. Before I get more into uh, constant ranting, I think since this is in a Revna Den episode, we are going to take communion before we do any more speaking it's almost a half hour intro sorry about that hey but you know what uh it's going to be three four episodes not 20 of them so going to shoehorn a lot of stuff in here hopefully it won't exceed you know the anywhere between 45 minutes to an hour and a half episodes and i do we'll see where we're going to go with this I'll probably be pausing a lot because I found out that if I just do one long stream on this camera, by the end of the video, it starts to get all flashy and, you know, pixelated. And so I'm going to I'm going to probably chop it up into different segments. Um, I even thought perhaps maybe I would do these on different days 
This is why I'm wearing the jacket too. I'll explain that in just a bit. But first, let's give thanks to the Lord for what he has done for us. The shedding of his blood, breaking of his body. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking you to forgive us of our sins, and our anger and rages and misunderstandings of what you were trying to do during this hour, even though if we, even if we do have an understanding of it, to just be in constant anger and upset and depression and despair and rage during this time of unfolding and exposures and the revealings that you're doing right now. And we're constantly waiting and waiting and waiting for the tables to finally flip and understanding, uh, even as the prophet said, that even before then, it's supposed to be getting even worse, even darker, even more just pressed in profound than we could possibly imagine with what the elite, what this Luciferian order is trying to do to bring back power to themselves. But we also need to understand that this is, this is a trap that you have set up too. And they're taking the bait. We've seen them taking the bait. We just seen the judge with Trump during his ruling just the other day, uh, he, he took the bait. And we know that this is a trap. This is a setup for his exposure, for the briberies to come forth and expose him and have his downfall come. And the more that they try and push their agenda, the more exposures will come until they finally snap and just go all out and bring death and destruction in mass abundance on a worldly scale, especially here in America, where we, where we have been infiltrated left and right, both in politics and within our nation, through the borders, through the military, through different governmental agencies. They have taken us over, uh, hand over fist, just insane amounts. And they're plotting and planning something, and they're going to bring it to fruition. But that, uh, that final plan that they do is going to be the trap that you have set for them. We need to be awake. We need to be aware. We not. We need to not be in discouragement. We need to not be agreeing with what the enemy is doing. We need to speak out against it. We need to declare and decree. We need to be in agreement with what you are doing and have an understanding of what you are doing right now and know that this time is a time for your revival, for your renewal, for your recompense, for your your restoration, for your provision of all things. We need to lean into you and understand that this worldly system of money and the five-day work week and just being beaten down and enslaved to this worldly Babylonian fiat system is not what you had intended for your children and that it needs a collapse. The worldly system needs a collapse. The, the fiat system needs a collapse and we will see the destruction of this and we need to not be in just constant just worry about it worry at the losses of what's going to happen because you're going to restore it to something much greater and much grander we need to get rid of these dark thoughts we need to start contemplating and giving into discernment and prayer and asking you and asking the holy spirit and going deep into ourselves and understanding why we are having these dark thoughts and why we are rushing into this and not waiting on you not leaning into you and not pressing into you during this time lord I hope, I pray that you will be able to send the Holy Spirit or give me some sort of discernment or clarity, even better than what I'm going to be diving into today and just my own words, that you would help me speak and give them better understanding into exactly what it is that you want them to ponder upon when moving into this spiritual warfare time. This flipping of the new age which is coming, which I feel is the age of Philadelphia the final one which all churches say that they are and none of them have attained we will be entering into the age of philadelphia the age of bro brotherly love and it'll be a time that is gonna blow us away but we need to get past our own dark thoughts we need to get past our own uh, minuscule understanding of what is happening or misinterpreted understanding of what is going down lord and i pray that you help us during this time during this uh series hopefully it'll be a three-part series <laughs> I don't have too much to explain upon right now, but we'll see when we dive deeper into it what will happen. And I ask that you are here with us and help us understand it and give clarity and comfort and correction and provision and discernment and understanding to the people watching this so that they can overcome their dark thoughts as well and lean more into you during this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so... 
let's begin. So a couple days ago was Ash Wednesday. For those of you who are practicing and understand that it's still the 40 days of Lent now that we're doing this. Um, I went into a service that evening. It was on Valentine's Day, so I got off work. We ran to church. And we did the service before heading out to dinner uh, for Valentine's, Liz and I. So we did it all geared up in uh, our Valentine's clothes with the crosses on our forehead. <laughs> so, had a few people ask us about that. Um, uh, even at the grocery store when we were picking up some bubbly for Liz afterwards. Uh, I found it interesting that uh, my church in particular at this Nazarene church, uh, the pastor was decked out all in black as well too. And any time that I could go to a service where he looks like Johnny Cash, rest assured I'll attend. We also had Ash Wednesday Lent beads no, I got two. Uh, one of the people, <laughs> one of the congregants that go there, Carol, who's pretty awesome. She's got like six of them on her hand. It's really cool. Um, and all the candles there for Lent, I think probably for each week that it, it, it goes to. Anyways, uh, those were all black. And yeah, it was it was a very dark time. And I, my birthday is on February 26th. So I'm always in black because it's the same birthday as Johnny Cash. I have many friends who have the same birthday as I do. Probably like, so I know at least six people. And they, they always wear black. Well, not always, but they, they look best in black, I think is the best way to say it. Just must be something about that day. Um, and I was uh, pretty much a goth when I went to high school. I was always in black. You know, sometimes I have the black eyeliner and fingernail polish on and stuff like that. I'm going to listen to the Cure and Depeche Mode. Um, so we were going through Ash Wednesday. I felt kind of in my zone. <laughs> so going off. Anyway, uh, he brought up some questions, some contemplations that we were going to ask ourselves for Ash Wednesday. And I think it was a process of things we wanted to go over and think about during this time of Lent, during this time of contemplation and um sacrifice and fasting unto the Lord before Easter Sunday. And I actually uh, wrote the church um, and asked what those questions were because I, I remember there was like about five of them. And the first two were the most important to me, uh, but I couldn't remember them in exact detail. So I'm just going to paraphrase. The one that stuck out the most is, what do you do to return to God when you have your doubts? Um, when you have discouragement and stuff like that. And <clears throat> for me, it was always the walks I take with God or the time that I have in the shower because it's the only time I could speak to him <laughs> or in my office because I'm just constantly being badgered by family members all the time. So it's like the only time I, I get is when I'm out walking or just alone time in the shower in the office and uh, <clears throat> where I do contemplation and speak to him. And uh, I do get answers sometimes. I do get those nudges, those, you know, usually a couple word sentences from him that make me contemplate and go deeper and think more into it. And it sort of you turns me and brings me back around. Um, and I think one of the other questions, paraphrasing again, is what has God done for you, you know, in this time during your despair and darkness? And, you know, or can you think of times where he's brought you back or what, what has he done during that time to make you being on reverence and respect of him again. And um, one fairly recently, I think, was a return back to a friendship that I had, which I thought was just more or less never going to be. But um, yeah, it, it turns out that there's been sort of kind of what I was hoping for kind of gave me a nudge, uh, you know, just, just a nudge of encouragement, not a full blown thing, but just sort of, hey, I'm going to give you a nugget of something. You need to keep leaning and pressing into that and pushing forward and declaring and decreeing and being in agreement with that. And you'll see it blossom and unfold more as opposed to constantly being in discouragement and depression and leaning into what the enemy says, because that's what you will bring forth. You know, there's life and death in your mouth and blessing and cursing. And it's like, which one are you going to speak? 
it's not that God can't do it. He can, if it's within his, you know, his divine plan, his will to do so. You know, he's just asking for $2 billion. Is that part of his plan? Probably not. So you probably won't get that. Who knows? Uh, each to his own, I suppose, whatever the Lord has planned for you. But if it's within his plan, his answer is always yes and amen. The Bible specifically says that. And if it is yes and amen, then we need to be in agreement with what he's saying and speak into that and keep asking for it until we see it finally come to fruition. So I got a little nugget of that this past week, and it it, it was nice, and I'm not going to try and pressure or push too much into that, but I'll just let it unfold as it is according to, you know, what I was asking. I'll just keep praying into it. So I, I think... One of the reasons why we have such dark thoughts and such discouragement is because we don't see these things coming to fruition. We start speaking in against it. And I think this series needs to emphasize what it is that we need to be speaking into. And I thought Ash Wednesday would be a good time for this because it is a time of contemplation. It is a time of giving up self, of not being so self-centered and not thinking the world uh, revolves around us and leaning into what God is saying. And we need to start giving in to what he is calling us to do. And though, uh, for the most part, Lent is a time of deep intercession of uh, prayer and fasting and devotion unto the Lord. After going to that service, I kind of just, I, I had a thought and I'm like, you know, I'm going to do Ash Wednesday, but I'm going to take a different route from it. The whole purpose of fasting is to lean in the press, to get to know God more, to get him stronger, you know, to not to get him stronger. I'm sorry, to get us stronger in him. Um, to build up our faith into him. And I've done fasts before and I've done deep prayers before. And I'm like, you know what? It's, it's not the act of servitude or sacrifice so much that he's looking for as it is our obedience and listening to what he is calling us to do, what he is trying to say to us, what he is trying to put into our lives and being in agreement with that. And I think for this Ash Wednesday, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot more time of contemplation with me and the Lord. As opposed to, I'm just going to give up coffee for 40 days, or I'm just not going to eat meat for 40 days. Or, you know what, the devil doesn't care if you have a cheeseburger, and I'm pretty sure neither does God. It's the obedience that he's calling you to do. Now, there's people like Cat Care, where God says, you're not going to have pizza, you're not going to have soda, you're not going to have, I think it was ice cream, I think. She's done that for decades now, um, because it was in accordance to following the obedience of what he was calling her into, which is being a prophetess. And... Um, he, of course, said once they get a new home, you know, and she's finally settled into this new place, then she could have a pizza party and ice cream and soda. But I think it's more of the will of following the Lord into what he's calling you to do to show signs of obedience. Almost to like that a Job. I mean, luckily it was just pizza and soda. She didn't have to like, you know, lose family members and her entire <laughs> prosperity and business and everything. So uh, thankfully it wasn't that type of calling or showing of obedience. But I, I realized that... Um, I, mean, I, I just got off a 21-day Daniel fast uh, for coffee at the beginning of this year to try and focus more. And I got out of it, and I'm like, you know what? I, I didn't really – I just gave up coffee. That's all I did. I didn't really get into prayer more, get into intercession more, get into declaring and decreeing and walking with the Lord, you know, just speaking with him. Sometimes it's not always about the spiritual warfare of praying and declaring and decreeing. Sometimes he just wants us to rest at his feet and listen to what he has to say. And let him speak into our lives for once instead of us constantly speaking into it. And I'm like, I, I think maybe this time of Lent is the time that I just need to pull back a bit and let him lead finally and listen to what he has to say and just go for walks sometimes. Sometimes I don't say things. Sometimes I speak to him a lot. But I've been noticing that since I've been doing that since Lent, uh, He's been speaking back a little bit more. I, I mean, he's been giving me answers to certain things or questions, I guess, because he is Jesus and he is a rabbi. That joke, you know, why does a rabbi always answer a question with another question? You know, why shouldn't a rabbi answer a question with another question? So <laughs> that's kind of how he's been doing it to me. He's been throwing me little nudges of questions and then I, you know, respond accordingly. And it's like, oh, OK, yeah, you're right. No, that's that does make sense. Um, so. He is building me up a little bit more into that, and I thought this Ash Wednesday would be a good time to maybe 
delve into the dark thoughts and try and explain this a little more to you. This is why I'm wearing black now. Also because I don't know how this series is going to go. I don't know if I'm going to hit pause and then a couple days later finish the sentence I was going to say or go into a different topic, even though it's still in the one episode, if, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to wear this so it doesn't look like, you know, I'm pink one day and the next day I'm wearing a blue shirt, you know, and it's like you're confused. It's like, what, what's going on? So this will be the garb I'm having for dark thoughts, which, and I got a light changer. I'm not doing the candles, as you can see. Um, I'm going to keep it a little bit more low-key. I'm not going to set up the whole office and stuff like that. I thought purple is my favorite color, and it is kind of more of a sign for for a darker shade of color as opposed to maybe using a black light. But um, So I'll do that. I'm doing this to kind of give sort of the ambiance of dark thoughts and tying it into Ash Wednesday and tying it into contemplations and tying it into the whole way we need to maybe change our outlook on everything or give it a different perspective or give it a different thought. So um, kind of weird. It's... Uh, going on 40 minutes now and I'm still kind of doing the introduction so <laughs> maybe this is going to be a long series um no uh let's dive into it and start off um with reducto ad absurdum reducto ad absurdum is a process which C.S. Lewis used in his apologetics and for those of you who don't know who C.S. Lewis is he is the writer of Chronicles and Narnia he was a professor at multiple universities he wrote many books on many topics. He read a lot of books and he remembered everything that he read. He was pretty much a genius in the actual definition of the word. It was uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, writer of Lord of the Rings, who put up a wager for Lewis to say that if he didn't believe in God, because Lewis was an atheist at the time that they became friends, to try and disprove him through scripture, you know, through his own theories. And in the process of Lewis taking up this wager, he actually became a Christian because he found no fault in any biblical scripture. Um, man was pretty devout. He was an Anglican. Lewis was a Catholic, I believe. Um, but they were best friends, uh, or really good friends at least. They were part of this group known as the Inklings, uh, where they'd go and sit in pubs and have a pint or, you know, a little snifter of port and... Uh, have their pipe tobacco and sit and discuss theology and other topics. And uh, Lewis used reducto ad absurdum, which is pretty much an old Greek philosophy of taking a question out and following it through to its logical conclusion. And if the conclusion itself is absurd and silly and just dumb, you throw out the whole questioning altogether, or you have to reroute it to its logical con conclusion because you made a, a, you took a bad route. So the question is, how do we view the world today through this reasoning, through reducto ad absurdum, and even more so, not just the world, because there's so much going down in the world today, everything is just in such chaos and, and disarray, but our own personal thoughts and feelings toward what God says he's going to do compared to how we inside feel. We need to follow this through, this reducto ad absurdum of our own thoughts, of our own despair and discouragement and depression into what God is saying. We need to take our logical conclusions of what we think is going to happen Happen, and we're coming at least from a biblical perspective to a silly answer and so we need to throw out this answer and reroute ourselves direct on the path of what God is calling us to do and what his answer is not what our answer is we're drawing a picture and it's not the picture that God is drawing or promoting to us and telling us that it is so I think we need to realign ourselves with what God is calling us to do, figure out exactly why we are having these dark thoughts because we're putting ourselves in the center of it. We're putting our own egos, our own thoughts, our own desires, our own wishes and wants and needs, as opposed to what God is doing. And we're drawing a completely different picture than what he is drawing out for us. We need to throw away the pen and paper and let him draw it for us. So let's follow through with that conclusion. So the first question, or I shouldn't even say the first, the top question that most people have in this world, especially those who are agnostic and atheists and even Christians will bring up this question. If there is a good God, how come there is so much evil in the world today? Or just in general, how come there's so much evil throughout time, throughout the entire history of mankind? Evil has reigned. If there's such a good God, why? Is there so much evil reigning? And Lewis begs the question then by writing, how do you know it's evil? 
or better phrased, how do you know it's not good? What we have here is what Lewis calls the tertium quid, or the tertium quid, I guess, depending on how you say your Latin, is uh, known as the third option. In other words, a man cannot call a line straight unless he has some concept of what a crooked line is. And this particular concept of what a straight line is compared to a crooked line cannot be subjective. There has to be an objective standard. There has to be objective moral reasoning to what we understand as good and evil. And because of this, there needs to be a pinnacle force to this. There, there has to be an ultimate um, absolute judge or creator or concept or theory, if you will, to what is good and what is evil. That is above and beyond transcending human nature. I think uh, Louis Marcos said it best that even the most brash of rogues will yell at someone when they get cut off in the traffic lane or how people think that uh, everything is might makes right <clears throat> if there is no tertium quid might makes right is the best way to explain it and how professors will be like okay well if might makes right then i have all the power and authority within my class and i pass all the men and fail all the females you know and they're like well you can't do that there's there's a, there's a standard that's that's not right it's like well okay so you do agree with an internal sense of what is right and what is wrong these feelings which are endowed within us they are inherited, they are given to us by our creator. It even says in our constitution here in America, though I know in other countries it may be different to this understanding, but um, we are endowed by our creator with such inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so it goes to say that even though goodness isn't a right, uh, it's still embedded within us from the father as one of the traits that he has to understand absolute righteousness, absolute judgment, absolute truth, absolute goodness, as opposed to evil. So Lewis kind of brings up that question to show that the greatest argument against Christianity is actually the greatest defense for it. Because if there was no such thing as an absolute goodness, your question is moot. How come there's so much evil in the world if there's such a good God? It's like, how do you know what's good and evil? Your question becomes moot if you do not have that standard of what goodness actually is that is not on a substandard subjective level of just either believing what good is en masse, you know, or a cultural understanding of what good is, or even just your own personal ideology of what good is and what feels good as opposed to an absolute truth of what goodness is. This is where we get the tertium quid. It's called the third option. In other words, you can have a bunch of set standards of what good and evil is on a subcategorized level. And you can look at this through different forms of religion, such as pantheism. All right, look at all the Eastern Indian gods. You know, there's like thousands of gods out there. It's like, well, how do you know which ones are good and which ones are evil without the tertium quid, the third option, the higher standard of which these gods live by? And even in the concept of dualism, like with Zoroastrianism, or, you know, uh, Lewis considered this the man, the manly religion, sorry, where there's uh, dark stuff fighting light stuff, you know, and it's this eternal conflict between the good and the bad. Um, the, the manly religion of just taking a bar and being this, this eternal conflict of fighting forever throughout time to battle the dark versus light. When again, even in that concept, you need the tertium quid, the third option, the higher standard to say which one is right, which one is good, which one is evil. And you could just as easily say, well, this one's evil because of fill in the blank. This one's good because of fill in the blank. Oh, really? Well, that's just your opinion. I don't agree with you. When it's on that level between two different people, or between sets of people, or sets of gods, or sense of dualistic natures, there's always going to be that tertium quid, which is a third option. This is why Lewis says, the only way you can have true righteousness, true goodness, true justice, is through a monotheistic God, which transcends human nature and endows this understanding of right and wrong, and these rights to us. 
And it is through this understanding, this equation, if you will, of the tertium quid, that Lewis uses reducto ad absurdum from a biblical context to understand true righteousness, true good, true, in a sense, true evil, which I'll get into that in just a moment too. What is evil technically? If there was a good God and everything that he created was good in the beginning, where did evil come from? It's not this dark stuff fighting light stuff. It isn't stuff at all. If everything was good and everything was created by God, then God didn't create evil. Where did it come from? But first, uh, before we dive into the idea of good and evil, let's follow this path a little further on the tertium quid and understanding that if there is a monotheistic God who endowed us with these rights of understanding good and evil, and this is where the source comes from, where real truth comes from, real righteousness, absolute justice then we jump into the idea of jesus being part of the triune god there's god the father the son the holy spirit and the son came down and manifested himself as man and there's this other issue with the tertium quid the third option in believing that jesus himself was god and how do we overcome this theory is known as the trilemma This is the issue that Lewis brings up with Jesus, is that everyone says that Jesus was just a good teacher. He taught some good morals. He had a lot of nice things to say, but that's the extent of it. He wasn't God incarnate. He he didn't come down here as God in the flesh, as man, to be our kinsman redeemer and die on the cross for us, uh, for our salvation. And put all our sins upon him so that we can be redeemed and restored to the family of God. So Lewis breaks it down into three options. And this is a trilemma is that either Jesus knew he wasn't God and said he was, which would make him a liar, or that he thought he was a God and he wasn't, which would make him a lunatic, or he said he was God and he was God. Those are your three options. He was either a liar, a lunatic, or the real deal. You have no other options than that. So my question to you is, if he was just a good moral teacher, but he was a liar, he's not good. If he was, you know, a a, a lunatic and teaching the stuff, we need to just totally turn away everything that he said. Even if he had good ideas, it's totally irrelevant because a man was mad. Or if he was God, then we should probably fall down, worship him, listen to what he has to say and follow him because what he has to say is the most profound thing that any man has ever uttered throughout the entire course of human history. That God came down, manifested himself in the flesh to become one of us and live out our experiences and to die on the cross for us. That God so-called entered into this world for us and claimed himself to be God as Jesus did. So, if Jesus said he was God, and he was God, then we should listen to what he has to say based on the tertium quid of him being God and knowing exactly what is right, what is wrong, as him being the pinnacle, the head on down from which good and evil breaks apart. We always think of good and evil in the sense of dualism in Christianity as God versus Satan, or Jesus versus Satan, but that's not it because Jesus is not on the subcategorized level. He is the tertium quid, the third option. So it's a substandard level of, say, St. Michael versus Satan. And if there is that tertium quid from God on downward, then we need to look at everything that we are seeing in our lives today and using reducto ad absurdum in alignment to what scripture tells us, to what is good, what is bad. And I, I'll get into this a little bit, and this is something to maybe just bang around in your head for a bit. And I believe Lewis brings this up as well, too. The fact that if there is a God, and he's all good, and all righteous, and he has absolute truth, and no evil is found in him, and he created the earth in six days, and during that time, everything that he created was good, where does evil come from? It's not a separate entity that entered in on its own. It wasn't something that he created and brought in to bring in this dualistic nature that a lot of us think Christianity and other religions and even a sense of morality that we have is. That we're constantly fighting against just darkness. 
that's not it. It's in short, our choices, our free will. Think about it this way. No one ever does evil just for the sake of being evil. I used to like Maleficent and Sleeping Beauty because her whole, her whole scheme was just being evil, just to be, you know, a raging witch minus the W, if you get what I'm saying. I always liked that Disney film because there was there was not really a, a, a motive. It wasn't until the live action film where you see the motive be played out. Like she she was abused, she was you know she was taken advantage of. Um, you know it was more of a revenge film, and that kind of added flavor to it. But in the original Sleeping Beauty from Disney, I mean that there, there was just there was there was nothing there. That there was no she just she just wanted to do it just to do it because I am an evil sorceress. Um, but no one acts that way. No one's like that. There is no such thing as just evil for the sake of evil. There's always intent behind it. And for the most part, the thing that got into my mind was power. Power because of pride. Now, pride is the greatest of all sin, but when you think about it, any type of evil that is done, it is done out of necessity, it is done out of a power grab, out of out of a gain, out of I need this because for you know, this is for me, this is what I want. I'm going to attain this by any means necessary, even at the hurt and harm of others to get this. So evil is nothing more than corrupted goodness, as Lewis puts it. There's no such thing as a separate entity of evil just a misguided and misunderstood evil that is completely different from the call and will of God. God has a will. He has a plan for us. He wants us to be in all goodness and evil is corrupted goodness based on what we wanted outside of his plan. This is how Satan fell. This is how Eve fell. This is how all of mankind has fallen. This is why we still have evil perpetuated today because it is a will of the flesh or a will of pride or a will of self that pulls us in to these needs. So now we need to look at reducto ad absurdum and the dark thoughts we are having right now and thinking, why is God doing this? Why is there so much evil in the world? Why is he taking his time on this? Why am I not seeing the, the turnaround happen yet? Why am I seeing nothing but evil all the time? Why is there no good? Why is, you know, nothing going down? And I feel this is where I'm going to leave it. I'm going to let you ponder on these thoughts about the process of using reductor ad absurdum to reroute your thoughts to maybe get to your logical conclusion and think that is absurd. To put the tertium quid in there, the third option, the thing that sets apart good and evil and what is the standard of which both lie in, of what true good and evil really is, and the trilemma that Lewis brings up on Jesus Christ. And is if he is truly God and not a liar and a lunatic, then we need to focus on what he is saying is absolute truth and absolute righteousness, absolute good, and how the corruption of that good technically is the evil we see in the world today. And we need to fall away from that and get into alignment with what is God, uh, with what God is calling us to do. Sorry. So I will start up the second episode where we left off here, where we fudged around with some of these words and thoughts. And then I will start going into the questions that we had during this time of say, for instance, oh, this is not going to come to fruition. Oh God, why am I not seeing this? Why is this not manifesting? Why, why is nothing happening? You know, I'm, I'm not believing in what you're saying because nothing has been done so far. Look at all the exposures that's happened, but nothing's coming around on and on and on. We'll bring up some of these questions and we'll break each of them down through the reducto ad absurdum with the tertium quid and what God is trying to focus on and how we are drawing a different picture with our own dark thoughts, with our own discouragement and depression and desires, which may be completely contrary to the will of God. Some, yes, are for him. Others might not be part of his plan. And I think we're trying to impose certain things into his plan that we don't see coming to fruition or if they are and god is in agreement with it they haven't come to fruition yet because there's still a plan which needs to be laid out and again we're, we're very we're very jumpy we're very tick-tocky we're very like we're in a we're in a now type of world when we want to see this done instantaneously and i think we need to move past that we need to take a, a step First, we need to take a step back before we move past it and contemplate and think again exactly on what it is that God is calling us to do and how we're looking at this from the wrong perspective. Once we get that 
in alignment and in check with what God is wanting us to do, then we progress further. And I have noticed this since the beginning of this year, and especially after Valentine's gift, which Lord, thank you for that Valentine's gift, which I, which I got on Ash Wednesday. It started that day. It was a good gift. It was a good little nugget. I, I, I did like it. It changed my perspective and my thought and the way that I'm asking God on particular things and waiting. And just, it's, it's kind of a breath of fresh air, even though I'm still kind of you know, pent up and a little agitated and stuff and waiting for everything to go down. It's allowed me to rest more into him and to ask the right questions and to speak into the right things. And I think once we start aligning this up with some of the things I will mention in the next episode, hopefully you will be able to fall into this category as well, because I don't know your situation. I don't know the things that you're asking for. I don't know the troubles you're having, but I hope you can at least use these tactics, especially the spiritual warfare tactics on to understand exactly how God is moving. I shouldn't have phrased it that way because I don't know how God's, I, I don't have the answers and how he's doing it. I'm just giving you ideas to maybe think about and ponder upon in your own life on how he may be changing it for the better for you, but you need to get into alignment and an agreement into what he is trying to work out as well. Not just straight shot forward to what you're asking for, just expecting to see the gifts. Got a buzz from someone. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I will catch you I'd say next week, but I'm not sure how I'm going to do these episodes. Uh, the second one will drop, I guess, just when it does. Hopefully I'll get all three of these done before Lent finishes or before Easter comes around. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Again, I know I was ranting and raving, going in all sorts of different subjects and tangents and different directions. And I hope those who are listening were actually able to follow my, my bizarre zigzagging spider webbed trail. And uh, next week, hopefully, we'll go a little bit more deeper into the questions that they have and how to overcome them and how to look at them from a different perspective and move closer into what you are calling them to do and lean in and press in more to what you are doing, Lord, and give them a breath of fresh air and understand that not everything's going to be about the warfare. Sometimes we just have to rest and wait on the Lord and we have to understand where he's coming from, the plans that are being set out during this time where sometimes it's just going to take a while for it to, to, to come about. So, but we need to trust in you. We need to understand that you are absolute goodness, absolute righteousness, absolute truth, and that everything good comes from you. And though we do not see the plan set out before us, or we do not see the things coming to fruition in right before our eyes, that if we trust in you, things will work out for the greater good. And I think that's the outlook we need to have. We'll get into that next week. Lord, thank you for this time for helping me. Uh, help me next week. Help others, especially during this time, who are having the struggles that I had within the past couple of years. I ask this in Jesus' name. And the covering of his blood by the power of the Holy Spirit and through your will. Amen. That is it. I will catch you um, the next round. And we'll see what we have discovered since then. Uh, there is one more thing I'm going to do. I'm going to grab some paper over there. I got a little project for you right here. There was some things I was going to mention about a great courses uh, on the topic of C.S. Lewis done by Professor Lewis Marcos. And I have two chapters in there. They're audio books that I have. And if anyone is interested, I'll share with you those two chapters so you can do a little study guide along with what I'm talking about here where Marcos goes into great in-depth detail on this, the coverings of Lewis's writings with mere Christianity and the abolition of man, and um, just dives in deep with uh, some topics that I was bringing up tonight. But that's not what I—that's not the project I had for you. I was just going to say I'm not doing a book recommendation or you know like a, a profit recommendation like I did the first season. I'm going to give you contemplation things, and this is what we did at Ash Wednesday. The church actually sent me the, the questions that I was asking, that I was requesting while I was doing this video. So I, I printed them up and I almost forgot about them, but I'll, I'll do it now. I want you to think of these questions while we're doing this Dark Thoughts series. And by the end of the series, third, possibly fourth episode, I'm, I'm going to guess third. It, it seems like we're running through this pretty quick, but ask yourselves these questions. Because this is what brought me to a slightly different understanding on how to go about these videos. And the first question was, what are the deepest yearnings of your heart? Think of a time when you were away from God, what it was like. What you, I'm sorry, let me grab my glasses. What put you back on the road with him? 
Oh, that's better. Now I can read. Let's see, I'm going blind. In case you haven't noticed, so let's fix those. <clears throat> the second question: How did you find strength in a difficult or spiritually dry time or times? What pools do you draw from? Where do you find your joy? Third series of questions. What are the ways you feel vulnerable in your humanity? What parts of yourself need God's protection? What times of temptations? Oh, uh, in times of temptations, who is your shield? I'll learn to read, I promise. And the fourth question. When are you most aware of God's loving presence? What do you need to let go of so that you can receive God's gifts, his good gifts, this Lenten season? What do you need to trust him with? Now, these all are kind of like a package deal series of questions, but the first two, I think, were the main topics for me, especially when diving into this series. And I did a little contemplation on it, and I explained some of it to you. I will save the full extent of those answers that I have for the end of this series of so what I did. And at the end of each episode, I will read these questions again and see if you guys, you know, have thought about it or if you still need more pondering on uh, those particular questions. What's bringing you closer to the Lord? What, you know, the, the troubles and trials and situations? How has he been working through it? What have you been doing to bring yourself closer to him as well too? It rests at his feet um, to understand what he is doing during this time. Um, yeah, I couldn't think of a better time really uh, to do this Dark Thought series than Ash Wednesday onward into Easter. So the the blackness of the church, you know, my pastor, the candles, I swear in black, the, the ashes, the beads. I was like, this is a good time to do this. This is a good time to have those dark thoughts and to contemplate on those and to start diving deeper into what the Lord is calling us to do and really question ourselves and really question our motives and really question exactly what it is we're trying to get out of this whole situation. Not just not just the turnaround. Sorry, my beard's a little fluffy. Not, not just the turnaround, but... Um, you know, our, our focus in on God, are we waiting just for the answers that he's given us, the gifts, the restoration that he wants, or are we supposed to use this time to press in further into him to get more with him to return to our first love? And I think these are these are pretty pretty interesting questions that, that I did like, and um, again, I will give mine at the end of the series, and I hope you contemplate yours as well, and if you want to put anything in the comments, to, you know, maybe get it out into the open. Uh, for those of you who want to share with each other, go right ahead and do it. My comment section is always open. I leave it completely open. You know, even if you want to just sit there and swear the whole time at me, I'm, I'm not one of those people that shut off comments. I believe they're there for a reason. I just ignore the people that pretty much leave those, you know, <laughs> those type of remarks anyways, and try and hone in on the people that actually have questions and want to get into a discussion. So um, that's it. I will talk to you all later. Take care. God bless. I uh, love you very much and be strong in the Lord.